So John, maybe we can, uh, I can introduce you and we can start. Great, sure. Okay. Let me press the recording. Somehow the slides are switched back to- Yeah, yeah, it's my fault. Okay, uh, welcome everyone to Harvard CMSA Quantum Matter and Math Physics Seminar Series. We are very honored to invite Professor John Bites to speak today. We were especially excited when we heard that Professor John Bites accepted our proposal to speak on his February numbers, A and 24, on August 24. Uh, Professor John Bites is well known in the physics and mathematics community. Uh, he, he is the author of the week's findings in mathematics and physics, mathematical physics. He's also a co-founder of the N Category Cafe, and he has introduced uh, applied category theory, categorical theory concepts, and Cobordian hypothesis, and many other mathematical physics uh, in the in, into the closing discipline in mathematics and physics. And he also was the name as a fellow of the American Mathematical Society uh, recently for his contribution to higher category theory and mathematical physics and for popularizing these concepts and subjects. And today we are very happy again to have him speaking on AN24. Let me remind the audience, if you want to interact or ask questions, please raise your hands first and you can later report your name and state your question. So let's directly welcome John. It's all yours, thank you. Thanks very much. Well, it was a real treat to be invited by Juven Wang to speak on my two of my favorite numbers, 8 and 24, on 8 24. I'd given a series of three talks about this in Glasgow a while back, and they're on YouTube, and they're about the numbers 5, 8, and 24. And those are quite elementary talks. Uh, but here I want to go a little bit deeper into studying the numbers eight and 24, but I want to keep it entertaining rather than uh, extremely technical. So I'll talk about a lot of things and some of them I'll explain in detail, whereas others I will just gloss over. Uh, and there are also lots of aspects of eight and 24 that I won't even mention because there just isn't time to cover them all. And someday maybe I could write a long paper about this. Um, so I'll start with Clifford algebras. So in physics, people like Clifford algebras to study spinners, spin one half particles, uh, using the fact that the rotation group has a double cover called the spin group. And you can think of the spin group as sitting inside a Clifford algebra. Um, so the Clifford algebra, Cliff N, is a real algebra. 
that has n anti-commuting square roots of negative one in it, and it's freely generated by those, meaning that the only relation that you have is that these generators, EI, um, anti-commute and each square to negative one. And you can say both of those things at the same time using this formula here. Um, these were developed by Clifford and then rediscovered by Dirac in the special case uh, that Dirac was interested in, but they turn out to be a fundamental structure in mathematics. And already back in 1908, Eli Cartan figured out what the Clifford algebras actually were. And the first step or a key step in doing that is to show that Cliff N plus eight consists of 16 by 16 matri matrices with entries in Cliff N. So there's a kind of period eight phenomenon built into the Clifford algebras that you can filter, figure out the larger Clifford algebras once you know the first eight of them or the first seven, depending on how you count, I guess. Um, so there are fun eight fundamentally different kinds of Clifford algebras. If you don't put in any square roots of negative one, you just get the real numbers. If you put in one square root of negative one, of course you get the complex numbers. That's the most famous example. But then Hamilton noticed that if you put in two anti-commuting square roots of one, their product is a third square root of negative one and all three of those anti-commute but it's freely generated by two square roots of negative one that anti-commute. And he, those are now called the quaternions. Well, he called them the quaternions and they're quite important. If we put in a third square root of negative one, we get a direct sum of two copies of the quaternions. If we put in a fourth, we get two by two matrices with entries in the quaternions. If we put in a fifth, we get four by four complex matrices. Put in a sixth and we get eight by eight real matrices. Put in a seventh, we get the direct sum of two copies of that. Put in an eighth, and we get 16 by 16 real matrices. And then the pattern just repeats, getting 16 by 16 matrices in what we had before in the previous round of this Clifford algebra clock. There's a lot of structure to this, and it has lots of applications and implications. Uh, recently, I gave two talks that are on YouTube about something called the tenfold way which is a classification of states of matter connected to the Clifford algebras. Um, eight of these kinds of matter are connected to the real Clifford algebras, which is what I'm talking about now. There are also two more connected to the complex Clifford algebras, which I don't wanna bring into this story here. Um, so there, you can try to classify states of matter based on whether they have time reversal symmetry or, uh, charge conjugation symmetry, switching particles and holes. And if they have, and, 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 par, and eight of the options are described here. So in some of these, we don't have charge conjugation symmetry and some we do, but we always have time reverse. No, sorry, we don't always have time reversal symmetry. Sometimes we don't have that. Um, and these symmetries can each square either to one or minus one. And it turns out that uh, the Hilbert space of a state of matter with these various choices for how time reversal symmetry and charge conjugation symmetry obey are that such a Hilbert space, you can think of it as a representation of the corresponding sort of Clifford algebra. And this is the beginning of a beautiful long story, which is rounded out by the two complex Clifford algebras. And uh, anyway, you can watch my talks about that if you're interested in that. And I also have lots of links to papers about that. Um, but another thing that shows up about the power of the number eight coming from Clifford algebras is called Bott periodicity. Raoul Bott showed that you could calculate the homotopy groups of O infinity using Clifford algebras. What's O infinity? O infinity is the infinite dimensional orthogonal group. So ON is the group of linear transformations of RN that preserve the inner product. So it contains rotations and reflections in RN. You can take the direct limit of the ONs. Each ON contains the previous one. So you can take a, a kind of limit of them called a direct limit, and you get a group called O infinity, which you can actually describe as certain infinite by infinite matrices. Now, a homotopy group is a very important concept in algebraic topology 
if you have a space with a chosen point in it, you can look at all ways of mapping an n sphere into that space where you map the North Pole to that point, but you count two maps from the n sphere as, as the same if you can continuously deform one to the other. So you can look at homotopy classes, as they're called, of maps from the n sphere to your space, sending the North Pole to the chosen point. And the set of such uh, ways to do that is, is going to be a group, at least when n is one or more. And so that's called the nth homotopy group of your space. Raoul Bott was able, amazingly, to calculate the homotopy groups of O infinity, and that has applications for homotopy groups of the O n for finite n, which is what people are usually interested in. Those are a little bit more complicated and things simplify when you take uh, the dimension to go to infinity. And he showed that the n plus eighth homotopy group of O infinity is isomorphic to the nth homotopy group of O infinity. And the proof of that, uh, he uses Clifford algebras in a very beautiful way. If you ever look at Milner's book on Morse theory, there's a very nice argument that's proof that just takes about six pages relying on some facts about Morse theory that were developed throughout the whole book. Uh, but it, it's, it's a brilliant, uh, brilliant piece of mathematics. Now, what are these homotopy groups? Well, some of the homotopy groups are zero, but four of them are non-zero. The zeroth homotopy group of O infinity is Z mod two. That's fairly easy to see. The zeroth homotopy group uh, involves a zero sphere, which is just two points. So the, and one of them is being mapped to your chosen uh, point in O infinity. The other one can move around. So this is just saying that O infinity has two connected components. Namely, the transformations with the determinant is one, and the transformations with the determinant is negative one to give you the two components of O n, and those give you two uh, connected components of O infinity. So the rotations and the reflections. So that's Z mod two. Um, pi one of O infinity is also Z mod two. That comes from the fact that rotation groups, once they get high enough in dimension, like SO three, for example, are are not simply connected. Their, their fundamental group, that's another name for this pi one, is, is Z mod two. Uh, you may have seen the Dirac belt trick that if you, you, if you hold one end of the belt fixed and start turning the other around, if you can turn the other around twice, then you can straighten out the belt again, which is a way of saying that uh, there's a path in O3 that if you go around that path once, it's not homotopic to the constant path, but if you do it twice, it is. Um, pi two of every Lie group is zero. Pi three of O infinity is Z, the integers, and then it gets some more zeros, and then pi seven of O infinity is also a Z. And you can remember this by remembering the song, Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. I think every homotopy theorist knows the song goes Z two, Z two, zero, Z, zero, 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 Z. So that's how you remember it. But the interesting thing is not only that this eightfold periodicity, but that the non-trivial homotopy groups of O infinity are connected to these algebras called normed division algebras. There are four real finite dimensional algebras with a norm such that multiplication preserves the norm. So for example, the ordinary absolute value of the real numbers has the property that the absolute value of xy is equal to the absolute value of x times the absolute value of y. And that's the same for the complex numbers. And there's also an absolute value on the quaternions that has that property. And also on the octonions, which are a, the most exciting of the lot to me because they are a non-associative normed division algebra. And it turns out that there's a connection between these and these. And it's basically because um, you can describe line bundles over the projective lines on these different division algebras. Uh, using uh, maps from various ONs, use, sorry, using maps from various spheres into various ONs, and the non-trivial cases are, the, are, these, are these four. So there's some interesting peculiar relationship between the norm division algebras and bot periodicity, but there's actually a simpler relationship between norm division algebras and Clifford algebras, which goes roughly like this. I'll just very roughly sketch it out. So there's this rotation group, SON, that acts on RN, which we call vectors in physics, describing spin one particles. 
but it also has a double cover called spin n, and that has a representation on other kinds of entities called spinners, which we use to describe spin one half particles. And we describe those using Clifford algebras, because as I mentioned, the spin group, spin n, is actually a subset of the Clifford algebra closed under multiplication and inverses. Now, it turns out that there's a way to multiply a spinner and vector and get a new spinner. That is, there's a bilinear operation that takes a spinner and a vector and gives you a new spinner. And this operation is actually at the root of all the Feynman diagrams where a spin one particle, sorry, where a spin one half particle gets, uh, absorbs a spin one particle and, and then you get a spin one half particle again. The, the, way that the, the, the way that these particles transform as representations of spin n uh, says that when you uh, have carry out this interaction, part of the description of it is a map uh, where you multiply a spinner and vector and get a spinner. Sometimes, by the way, there are two kinds of spinners, a left and right-handed right kind of spinner. And in those cases, when you multiply a left-handed spinner by a vector, you get a right-handed spinner. But let's not worry about that so much right now. What I want to focus on right now is an amazing fact that when the space of spinners has the same dimension as the space of vectors, then you get a multiplication on some vector space of that dimension. Uh, you can, in other words, you can just crassly identify the spinners and vectors as being this vector space of some dimension, and it has this multiplication on it. And then, lo and behold, that will give you a normed division algebra. Uh, I have a review article on the Actonians where I show why, why it works that way. Um, it's not at all supposed to be obvious, but you can work out the norm division algebras that way. So the dimension of the vectors is just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or Rn, the, the vectors are n-dimensional. Whereas the spinners, are these representations of Clifford algebras. And the Clifford algebras, as you may have noticed before from my, from my green chart, uh, have dimensions that are powers of two. And, and the spinners also get dimensions that are powers of two. You just look for representations of Clifford algebras, essentially. Uh, and so, so the spinners have this more funny pattern of dimensions where it goes one, two, four, 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 eight, eight. The four cases where the dimension of the spinners matches the dimension of the vectors gives you normed division algebras, R, C, H, and O, the octonians. And that's it, because the way bot periodicity works is that the Clifford algebra uh, in dimensions eight more will be 16 by 16 matrices in the Clifford algebra you had. And so the spinners in dimensions eight more will have dimension 16 times as big. So like, for example, if we go up to a, a, a n equals nine, we'd get spinners would be 16 dimensional and the vectors would just be nine dimensional. So the spinners catch up and pass by the vectors in their dimension once you pass n equals eight and they never match again. So you only get four norm division algebras. Um, so that's another marvel of it the number eight. And of course, because I'm claiming eight is so great, it should be somehow the octonians are the most exciting of these. They're in some sense, the most exciting and the least useful. The real numbers are the most useful and the least exciting. And as you march up, it gets sort of more exotic and less commonly used. Now I wanna go in some peculiar direction with these normed division algebras. I wanna show you how they're connected to lattices. So crystallographers study lattices, but mathematicians have a more careful uh, or limited definition of lattices. Some things that crystallographers call lattices, uh, mathematicians would not call lattices. So let me say what a lattice is. Well, I look at something that looks sort of like this, but what is it really? So it's a subset of Rn, or an n-dimensional real vector space. It's a subset that's closed under addition and subtraction. So it's a subgroup, in other words, under addition. But it's not just any old subgroup, because sometimes you can have a dense subgroup, right? Like the rational numbers are a dense subgroup of R to the one, the real line. So we don't want that. Uh, so a lattice is a subgroup of Rn, and it can't be dense, so it can't be too big. But we also don't want it to be too small. For example, the trivial group is a subgroup of Rn, but we don't call that a lattice. Uh, and we wouldn't want to call just this plane here that I'm waving my pointer at. We wouldn't want to call that a lattice in R3 because it's not big enough. 
So we want a lattice to not be contained in any vector subspace, in any proper vector subspace of Rn. So it's a subgroup of Rn. It's not dense, but also not contained in any subspace of lower dimension. Now, when you have a lattice, you can talk about the volume of the unit cell. Here, the, I've drawn a unit cell uh, in blue, and you see that by translating with respect to lattice vectors, every point in R3 here is contained in some translated copy of this unit cell. And we can talk about the volume of this unit cell. Now, I could have also picked a different kind of thing that wasn't a cube, some other shape of parallelogram that would have the property of being a unit cell. For example, I could apply a shear to this cube and move these two points over to these two points and get a kind of sheared parallelopiped, uh, but it would have the same volume. So the volume of the unit cell is a well-defined invariant of a lattice in Rn. Now there is some terminology associated to lattices. So I just mentioned that a lattice has a volume of a unit cell and we call a lattice unimodular if its volume of its unit cell is one. So that's sort of a normalization condition. But we say a lattice is integral if the dot product of any two vectors in the lattice is an integer. Uh, so for example, Z to the N is an integral lattice in R to the N, Z being the integers. But then a more stringent condition is we say a lattice is even if the inner product of any lattice vector with itself is an even number. Now it turns out that any even lattice is integral. I'll let you do a little calculation to show that if V dot V is even for all vectors, V then V dot W is an integer for all uh, vectors V and W. Now, so these are some important uh, types of nice lattices and these nice types of lattices show up a lot in well, they show up in string theory, they show up in mathematics, they show up all over the place. And there's an amazing theorem due to someone named uh, Witt or Witt, I guess. Uh, Witt's theorem says that there exists an even unimodular lattice in Rn if and only if n is a multiple of eight. So only in dimension eight will you see your first even unimodular lattice. So they're quite exotic beasts. Uh, but they do exist in every dimension that's a multiple of eight. And I'll show you one. <laughs> I'll, I'll roughly show you one. Let's look at lattices in, divi in norm division algebras, though. So the real numbers are norm division algebra. The integers are a famous lattice in there. It's unimodular. The volume or the length, in this case, of the unit cell is one. It's integral, the dot product of any two uh, integers is an integer, uh, but it's not even because one times one isn't even. Uh, it's, um, so I wanted to, well, it's obvious here, but, but there's another good thing about the integers, which is that they're not only a lattice, they're also closed under multiplication. So they're a sub ring of the real numbers too. And I'm gonna show you lattices that have that kind of nice extra feature. So Gauss, tried to generalize number theory to the complex numbers. And the first thing he invented was the Gaussian integers. So those are the complex numbers of the form A plus BI, where A and B are integers. So they just like these grid points here. That's a lattice in R2, or if you prefer in the complex numbers. And it's an integral lattice, clearly the dot product of these vectors, the usual dot product of R2 uh, of them is, is an integer. Uh, and it's unimodular. The, unit cells, this unit square here, but it's not even again, because one times one isn't even. And again, they're closed under multiplication. So Gauss was able to generalize a huge amount of number theory to the Gaussian integers, and that started a huge subject of uh, algebraic number fields and algebraic number rings. Um, but what about the quaternions? Well, Hurwitz discovered something called the in Hurwitz integral quaternions, and these are a bit more subtle. You could, so the quaternions are all numbers of the form A plus BI plus CJ plus DK, where I, J, and K are anti-commuting square roots of negative one. Uh, you could make up some integer quaternions where you just require that A, B, C, and D are integers. Those are interesting, but it turns out to be much more interesting to study the Hurwitz integral quaternions, 
where either A, B, C, and D are all integers or they're all half integers. That is, they're all integers plus one half. So either all one way or all the other way. Um, so believe it or not, those are closed under multiplication. You know, it takes a little work to check that when you multiply things of this kind, they stay in this sort. Whereas if we just stuck with integers, it would be pretty obvious. Uh, but the, we wanted to make it a little bit denser. So we put in these uh, quaternions where all the entries are half integers too. Um, and it turns out they give you an integral unimodular lattice. So the volume of the unit cell is, oh, sorry, when you rescale them by the square root of two. So it's not an integral lattice yet, right? Because we're allowing these half integers here. So, so clearly the, uh, the dot product of two half integers or two of these guys that have some half integers and that may not be an integer, but if we multiply by the square root of two, then we get an integral lattice and then it'll also be unimodular. Um, but it won't still be an even lattice um, because, uh, because of these, these half integers. So like one half uh, times one half is a, is a quarter. And if I rescale by the square root of two, I, and then multiply them, I, I still don't get an even number. Um, this is a little picture of the Hurwitz integral quaternions where I've shown the origin at the center here. I've shown four coordinate axes going off in four directions. After all, if you can throw, draw three coordinate axes in the plane, you, why, you not, why stop there? You might as well draw four. Uh, and, and there are these dots here are the Hurwitz integral quaternions that are the closest to the origin. And I'll be saying a lot more about this thing. This is sort of the star of the show. But moving on temporarily to dimension eight, there are things called the Cayley integral octonians, which are a lattice in the octonians, which is closed under multiplication. I'm not gonna write out the formula for them because it's actually pretty complicated and be a little distracting right now. I've written a whole series of blog articles about integral octonians. Uh, so you can look there if you want, or just look in Wikipedia and it will explain you them. Um, and these, if you rescale them by the square root of two, you get an integral unimodular lattice, like we did with the quaternions, but now it will be an even lattice. This is the first chance we had to have an even lattice because this is now finally a multiple of eight. Uh, and this is a very famous lattice. Um, one way to get this lattice, well, it's called the E8 lattice. Um, one way to get it, which is very easy to describe, although very hard to do, is you just take a whole bunch of equal sized balls in eight dimensions, and then you pack them so that each one touches as many as possible in that dimension. And it turns out the most balls you can get to touch a single ball of the same dimension without overlapping in eight dimensions is 240. So all you have to do is pack balls such that each touches 240 others. And then it turns out you're forced to get the E8 lattice. That's remarkable because in three dimensions, the most balls you can get to touch as a single ball is, is 12 and you can do that, but, there are, but you can keep on doing that and that, that does not commit you to a single specific lattice. There are actually uncountably many different structures, not all lattices uh, that, that work in that type of way in three dimensions, but in, four, in eight dimensions, it's, it's a rigid thing. And uh, Marina Vyasovska recently proved that, uh, that this is also the densest way to pack balls in eight dimensions. So that's a marvelous thing. And that's where the marvels of the number eight really kick in where we're uh, simultaneously dealing with octonians and with lattices. But I don't wanna go quite in that direction. I'll go in a different direction, go back down to these Hurwitz integral quaternions, which are a lot easier to understand. So, so let's look at the Hurwitz integral quaternions that are the closest to the origin, except for zero itself. So they will be the ones lying on the unit sphere. They will be the ones that have norm one. Now, eight of them, it turns out that there are exactly 24 of them that lie on the unit sphere. So the number 24 is showing up here now. Eight of them are just the numbers plus or minus one, plus or minus i, plus or minus j, plus or minus k. So you go one inch or one centimeter in either direction along each coordinate axis, 
and you get them. And so if you did that in three dimensions, those would be the vertices of an octahedron. So here I'll call this the vertices of a hyperoctahedron, although there are more dignified uh, technical names for this shape, but it is a the four-dimensional analog of an octahedron. But then what about the ones where the components have are half integers? Well, there are a bunch of those that lie on the unit sphere as well. In fact, there are exactly 16 of those that lie on the unit sphere. They are the numbers one half times plus or minus one, plus or minus i, plus or minus j, plus or minus k. You can check with a little calculation that the length of this vector is one. And it comes from the marvelous fact that a quarter plus a quarter plus a quarter plus a quarter is one. Um, and so we can draw a hypercube like this. As you see, what I've done is I've drawn an ordinary three-dimensional cube and then pushed it over one centimeter uh, along the fourth axis and drawn another hypercube next to it and then connected all the vertices of the new one to the old one. So those are all the 24 Hurwitz integral quaternions on the unit sphere. If we put them both together, we get a more complicated looking picture. It's sort of hard to look at, but it's the combination of the hypercube and the hyperoctahedron. These 24 points here are the vertices of a four-dimensional polytope, four-dimensional analog of a polyhedron, and it's called the 24 cell. It's not called the 24 cell because it has 24 vertices. It's called the 24 cell because it has 24 faces. It has 24 faces that are each a regular octahedron, but it also has 24 vertices. So it's a very 24-ish thing. Now, it's even better than that, though. It's also a group. Why is it a group? Well, you can multiply quaternions, yes, and, and the, it's a norm division algebra. So if I multiply two quaternions that have norm one, I get another quaternion that has norm one. So the, the quaternions of norm one form a, a group. It's also the unit sphere. That group is usually called SU2 because we usually think of it in terms of complex matrices, but you could also think of it as the group of unit quaternions. It's the double cover of the rotation group, but it turns out that it has some interesting subgroups and one of its finite subgroups is these Hurwitz integral quaternions. So it's a 24 element subgroup of SU2. There are lots of ways to think about this thing. One of the most fundamental in a way is if I take a regular tetrahedron and I look at its rotational symmetries, the ways that I can rotate it back to itself, that will give me a 12 element group because there are four factorial permutations of the vertices, but only half of them come from rotations. The other come from reflections. So that rotation little symmetry group of the uh, tetrahedron is 12 elements. But if we look at its double cover up in SU2, the double cover of the rotation group, that will have 24 elements. And that's exactly this group. So this is just the double cover of the rotational group of the tetrahedron. So starting from the tetrahedron, we get this marvelous thing. Now there's more to it than that, because it turns out that if you take the vertices of a hypercube, there's 16 of them, they actually, you can partition them into the vertices of two different hyperoctahedra. So we already had this, we already had this 24 cell with its vertices chopped into one hyperoctahedron and a hypercube, but we can chop the vertice, partition the vertices of this hypercube into two more hyperoctahedra. So taken all together, the vertices of the 24 cell can be partitioned into the vertices of four different hyperoctahedra. They don't look the same in this picture. They're the red, green, and blue dots. They don't look all congruent to each other, but that's because we're taking this four-dimensional shape and squashing it down in two dimensions, and it ruins the, a lot of the symmetry. So here we're seeing a really nice relation, which we're, you haven't seen the end of it yet, but we're beginning to see a nice relation between the numbers 24 and eight. You knew already that 24 was eight plus eight plus eight. You didn't need me to tell you that, but now we're seeing that it has this geometrical significance in terms of four dimensional versions of platonic solids. But there's much more to it than that because it turns out that this 
that if you rescale the Hurwitz integral quaternions by square root of two, you get an integral unimodular lattice. And those are very nice. They're very often connected to Lie groups and Lie algebras. This particular one, by the way, is called the D4 lattice. And D4 is connected to the Lie group spin eight, which is the double cover of SO8. So what this means is that there's a whole theory whereby you can study the representations of simple Lie groups using lattices. And if you do it for spin eight, you use this particular lattice called the D4 lattice. In particular, any irreducible representation of spin eight, you can think of as a way of coloring uh, the dots on the D4 lattice. Um, that's a rather vague way to say what's going on. But in the particular case that we're at hand, these three uh, sets of eight vertices, these three hyperoctahedra, they actually correspond to basis vectors for three different eight dimensional representations of spin eight. I mean, there, there are eight blue dots, eight green dots, and eight red dots. And those correspond to basis vectors for three different representations of spin eight. And those are the vector representation, which is eight dimensional, just because rotations are already acting on it. But then there are spinner representations. And in fact, in this dimension, there are two different kinds, left and right-handed spinners. And those are also eight dimensional, as I mentioned, that's sort of what gives rise to the octonians. Uh, but now we're seeing that they all also arise from this uh, 24 cell. And as I mentioned, each of these eight dimensional representations can be seen as a copy of the octonians with the octonian multiplication coming from the way that you can multiply a vector with a left-handed spinner and get a right-handed spinner or vice versa. You can take a vector and multiply it by a right-handed spinner and get a left-handed spinner in this dimension. Now, this idea of three copies of the octonians is actually shows up in physics. It turns out that when your people are describing super strings, one way that you can start out describing it is imagine that this, the, a string is like a circle. As it moves through time, it traces out a two-dimensional surface called the string world sheet. And the way that it vibrates around is in this particular theory described by a field on that world sheet. And it's a field taking values in the Octonians direct sum, the Octonians direct sum, the Octonians, three copies of the Octonians. What you th think of is that these three copies of the Octonians correspond to three different representations of spin eight. And spin eight has to do with the eight, it's the double cover of the rotation group in the eight spatial dimensions, which are transverse at right angles to the world sheet. So you've got an a two-dimensional string world sheet moving in 10-dimensional space-time, and there are eight transverse directions. And to study how the string wiggles, we need to think about those, and we wind up needing fields to transform in representations of spin eight. And it turns out that in superstring theory, this O plus O plus O valued field is what you use. So the vector copy of O describes the nor normal motion of the string in the eight directions transverse to the world sheet. And those are just ordinary vector displacements in space-time. So those are, are what you'd call the bosonic aspect of the, of the superstring. Where, but then there are also the left and right-handed spinners, and those describe the string's fermionic degrees of freedom. Uh, so combined, they give you this superstring. I should say that I'm not a string theorist, uh, if, if you start asking me detailed questions about string theory, I could easily collapse. Uh, I also don't particularly believe in string theory as a theory of physics, whatever it means to say that you believe in a theory for which there's no evidence yet, except that it's mathematically beautiful. But I love the mathematics of it, uh, at least insofar as I understand it. Uh, and one of the interesting things is that it exploits all the beautiful mathematics uh, connected to exceptional objects like the Octonians or like E8 and so on. And I think this accounts for part of its continued popularity in the lack of experimental evidence. It will certainly continue to be a mathematical subject for as long as people are doing mathematics. So I'm, I don't feel bad about talking about it. <laughs> 
So we've seen the numbers eight and 24 really do show up in string, super string theory, starting from the way bot periodicity gives rise to the Actonians, but then also how the Hurwitz integral quaternions give rise to the 24 cell and the three eight dimensional irreps of spin eight. But also the number 24 shows up in some other way that seems different at first. It starts uh, starting from the simplest field theory of all. So now we'll come down to earth a little bit here and let's look at the wave equation. So the wave equation describes a scalar field oscillating in waves. We could think about it in R2, but I'm gonna think about it on R times S1. So time will run along a line, but the spatial coordinate will go around a circle of radius one. And so our field phi, uh, just to keep things simple in certain ways, I'll let it be complex valued. That makes the Fourier analysis simpler. Uh, and so phi will be a map from R cross S1 to the complex numbers. So the wave equation in two dimensions is very beautiful because you can factor the operator ddt squared minus ddx squared into ddt plus ddx and ddt minus ddx. And so using that, you can show that any solution of the wave equation can be written as a sum of a part that's a solution of the simpler equation where you use one of these operators and the other equation where you use the other operator. So in other words, it's a sum of left moving and right moving waves. So here, this function f depends only on t minus x. So it moves to the uh, right, I guess, at, at unit speed. And it would be a function that would be annihilated by the operator ddt plus ddx. Uh, I hope I'm getting these, <laughs> all these things exactly right. It doesn't really matter. Uh, g depends only on t plus x. And so if I haven't gotten my left and right mixed up, that would be a, yeah, that would be a right, a left moving wave. Uh, and that would be annihilated by this operator. So that's old stuff. But now I said I was going to talk about the simplest field theory in the universe. And well, I might have fooled you into thinking it was going to be the wave equation, but we've seen there's an even simpler equation where we just keep the left moving waves by just saying d, d phi dt equals d phi the x. Um, and, and if you've ever seen a barber pole turning around, if, that's basically a, a movie of a solution of this wave equation where the, these, the, the waves just spiral around. Well, if, if we did it really correctly, they'd spiral around so that they'd come back around after time two pi in our, in our uh, coordinates here. This I claim is a very simple field theory. You know, we have an exact solution for it and everything. You might think there's like nothing much to say about it, but it turns out that if you quantize this field theory on this cylinder that we've been talking about, it's you can make a very good case that the vacuum energy of this field theory is negative one over 24. So the number 24 has shown up from this seemingly uh, unpromising subject. Now, vacuum energy is something you sort of get to decide. You can add a constant to the vacuum energy if you feel like it, because we can only experimentally measure differences in energies. But the field theory is best behaved when you decree that the vacuum energy is negative one over 24. So why? Okay, here's why. So we're looking at these, well, I mean, now I may be saying left. I apparently don't know the difference between left and right. It doesn't really matter. <laughs> it's just a matter of whether you put a plus here or a minus here. I, mean, I feel that my slides are, are being uh, contradictory here because the, the ah, because this picture looked awfully right moving to me and now I'm saying left moving. But luckily it, it doesn't, either one would work. We're just picking one of them. So every such solution is a linear combination of waves where the frequency K could be any integer. So the frequency of the wave phi sub k is just k. So that means that uh, each individual one of these uh, eigenmodes uh, of the wave equation is just like a harmonic oscillator. We haven't quantized yet. So, so far it's like a classical harmonic oscillator, one of each frequency k for each, uh, for each natural number, one and on up. 
I'm going to throw out the frequency zero solution here. I'm going to mod out by the constant functions. The, the frequency zero solution is a constant solution that is both left moving and right moving. And that's a slightly subtle issue, which I would like to avoid. So I'm just going to keep these, these solutions where it's really moving to the left, not just sitting there. Um, now let's use units where Planck's constant is one. Then as you know, when you have a quantum harmonic oscillator of frequency omega, it's ground state energy is one half times that frequency omega. When you've got a bunch of oscillators, their ground state energies should add. And since the left moving wave equation is isomorphic to a collection of oscillators of frequencies one, two, three, and so on, its ground state energy should be one half times the sum of these frequencies. So one half of one plus two plus three and so on. Now that looks like infinity. And indeed, when people first invented quantum field theory, this is probably one of the very first uh, uh, of the many divergences that, to, that they encountered in quantum field theory. So how, what do you do with it? Well, one way to do it is you'd say, we'll use a trick, sometimes called normal ordering, to just make the ground state energy equal to zero. We'll just rescale the shift the ground state energy so it's zero. But that turns out not to be the best thing to do in this particular situation. In fact, way back in 1735, Leonard Euler gave a bizarre proof, quote unquote, that the sum one plus two plus three plus four, et cetera, is not infinity, it's not zero either, it's negative one twelfth. If you believe that, then the ground state energy of the quantized left moving wave equation should be negative one over 24. But why in the world should you believe this? Well, first, at least let me give you his uh, argument, which is at least amusing. Apparently there are a lot of video, YouTube videos now where people are arguing about whether you're allowed to say that this equation is true or not. And, and these staunch defenders of convergent series who think that like, hey, I learned that you're not supposed to sum divergent series are sticking up for what they learn and they're saying like, you should never say this. I have a more flexible point of view. I, I completely believe in convergent series and, and, I, and I love them, but I don't think that's the only thing you can do with series. Euler uh, came before the staunch defenders of convergent series took over the world and, and he just did all sorts of cool stuff. So he started with the geometric series the sum is one over one minus X and he was free to play around with it because no one was going to hassle him. So he just said, okay, I'll differentiate both sides. This is really nice, right? I get one plus two X plus three X squared by bringing down these exponents. Take the derivative of this. I get one over one minus X squared. And then he did something which the defenders of convergent series would, would hate. He said, what happens when we set X equals negative one? Well, you could say it diverges, but what is it? It's one minus two plus three minus four and so on. And over here on the other side, you get one fourth. So this is how Euler summed the alternating uh, series, one minus two plus three minus four and get one quarter. Now going right along, sorry, ah, marching right along, he did the following thing. He studied this function. This is what he was actually interested in. We now call it the Riemann zeta function, one to the negative s plus two to the negative s plus three to the negative s and so on. He was really trying to figure out stuff about that. He took this function and he multiplied it by two to the negative s. And then he subtracted twice the second equation from the first equation. So you'll notice what that does. You're subtracting off every other term uh, from the first series, but you're subtracting it off twice. So now you get the alternating series, one minus one to the negative s minus two to the negative s plus three to the negative s minus four to the negative s. So that is one minus two times two to the negative s times this zeta function. Um, so this is all perfectly legit if the real part of s is big enough so that this series converges, but Euler was interested in the fun cases where it doesn't converge. So, so what he did was he, he took that result that I just, I'm just copying it down here and he set S equals negative one. So if you set S equals negative one in the zeta function, you get one plus two plus three plus four, et cetera. 
And if you set it equal to negative one in this stuff out in front, you get negative one third. And so we got negative one third times the sum of the uh, whole numbers is the alternating sum of the whole numbers. But he had already figured out the right-hand side here is equal to one quarter. So the sum of the whole numbers, according to him, is negative one twelfth. That was his calculation. Believe it or not, he went on from here to do a bunch of calculations, giving results that make perfect sense, even to people who only limit themselves to convergent series. For example, he figured out that the sum of the reciprocals of the squares is pi squared over six, uh, using these type of methods. I'm um, sorry, I keep doing the wrong thing here. Now that looks crazy, of course, but now we understand a lot more about this than he did at the time. This sum was studied by Riemann and now called the Riemann zeta function. Uh, was, and, it, and it converges when the real part of S is bigger than one. You get an analytic function in that half plane, and then you can analytically continue it over to the point where S equals negative one. And then you can prove rigorously that zeta of negative one is negative one twelve. Thus, to some extent, justifying what Euler did. And in quantum field theory, there's a whole discipline called zeta function regularization, where you make these seemingly divergent vacuum energies and other quantities uh, converge. Uh, well, it still is black magic, you have to admit. What you do is you, is you make them depend on, the, on some parameter, like the dimension of space-time or something, and you go to a region where that uh, function becomes convergent and sum becomes convergent and you get an analytic function and then you analytically can continue back to where you're actually interested. So let's just assume Euler calculation, Euler's calculation is right and see what we can do with it. What do we get for the partition function of the left moving scalar field? We already worked out the vacuum energy, it's negative 124th. What about the partition function? That's a very important quantity in quantum field theory. Sorry, I keep going backwards here. Okay, so for any system with a bunch of eigenvalues of its Hamiltonian, Ej, remember its partition function, z of beta, is just the sum of e to the negative beta times Ej over all the different eigenvalues counted with multiplicity. Here, beta has the physical meaning of inverse temperature, or if Boltzmann's constant is one. Um, so to calculate this, we can do it pretty quickly for our scalar field if we use this fact that when you combine several independent systems, their partition functions just multiply. That's an easy thing to show given this, given properties of, of the exponential function and summation. So what we'll do is we'll think of our left moving wave equation is a bunch of quantum harmonic oscillators, calculate their partition functions and then multiply those. So you probably know if you've studied quantum physics, what's the partition function of a quantum harmonic oscillator, but it's easy to do. So we might as well just do it. So the oscillator with frequency omega will have these energy eigenvalues, half omega, that's the ground state energy, and then going up by integers from there, one and a half, two and a half, three and a half, and so on. So its partition function is, I'm sorry, that I should not be there. That's a little typo from back when I was <laughs> working with some different conventions. So it's e to the minus n plus a half beta omega summed over all n going from zero on up. But that's easy to do. You pull out the, the minus one half beta omega and then the rest is a geometric series. So it sums up to one over one minus e to the negative beta omega. So we get this, ratio here as the partition function of the harmonic oscillator with frequency omega. Okay, now what about the problem we're interested in, the left moving scalar field? Well, that's isomorphic to a collection of oscillators with frequencies one, two, three, and so on. So its partition function will be a product of expressions of the kind that I just worked out, where the frequency k goes from one to infinity in integer steps. So when we multiply that out, the numerator, I will pull that out, pull out that infinite product and we get an infinite sum in the exponent. And then we get this product of the denominators. Now you'll notice that the numerator is fairly problematic because basically because the infinite ground state energy of the uh, 
of the field theory is coming in there. So we get e to the minus the sum of one plus two plus three and so on times beta in front. So you could just give up then. Uh, or you could say, well, I know Euler told me what that ground state energy is. It's uh, the ground state energy is negative 124th. So, so here we get yeah, extra minus sign makes it a plus 24th. So we get the Z of beta, the partition function is e to the 124th beta times this product of one over one minus e to the negative K beta. So that's strange, but it's interesting. What's really interesting is that this function had been known long before quantum field theory. It's called the reciprocal of the Dedekind eta function. It was introduced for purposes of number theory by Dedekind. Uh, and it's a marvelous, important thing. So moving right on though, we could replace the inverse temperature beta by it because inverse temperature is plays a role in physics like imaginary time so i'm going to switch over to uh calling it it which is why there's that annoying little i typo in my slide earlier on i've been changing my mind about how i was going to organize this so now beta has become it now we get this quantity here and this converges when t is in the complex upper half plane because then uh then these terms here go to zero exponentially as k gets big. So, so this is a good quantity up in the upper half plane. That's an analytic function. And what is it? Well, now what it is, is it's the partition function for a torus shaped space time. So we're, we're basically looking at periodic boundary conditions, not only in space, but in time of our field theory, but we've, we've, we've gone Euclidean. We, we've, we've gone to uh, putting space and time on the same footing. So, so space here goes from zero, spatial coordinate goes from zero to two pi and then it wraps around. But the time uh, coordinate, we're letting it go up to some point in the upper half plane T and then it wraps around. And so if both of those happen, we get this blue parallelogram here with its boundaries identified. Uh, which is a torus, and it's just the complex numbers modulo this particular lattice. So that's what Z means. It's the partition function of this field theory, but thought of uh, on a, on a space-time like this. Now, there's something funny, though, if you want to think about it that way, because the same space-time comes from different parallelograms. You see, the torus that we get when we curl up this parallelogram is the same as the one where we add two pi to uh, to this lattice vector and get and use t plus two pi, uh, and this is an example of what I mentioned before that the same lattice will have a bunch of different choices of unit cell. We got this blue unit cell and this yellow unit cell. They have the same area, and they also give us the same Riemannian manifold. The same manifold with geometry when we take the plane and curl it up this way. So if we're trying to say that the function Z is the partition function of a field theory on this torus, it had better not depend on how we're thinking of that torus, whether we're thinking of it as coming from the value T or from the value T plus two pi. So our calculation is only giving a well-defined partition function for this torus, this Riemannian torus, if this partition function is unchanged when we add two pi to t. However, it does change. If you add two pi to the e to the negative i k t, that doesn't change because of the properties of e to the two pi i being one, uh, but this part in front does change. It gets multiplied by e to the two pi i over 24. So that's annoying. We're, we're getting what you call an anomaly in our quantum field theory. Now you might've said, well, why, if you'd only set the vacuum energy equal to zero, you wouldn't have that annoying term in front and then we wouldn't run into this problem. And that is true. If you'd set the vacuum energy equal to zero, you could get a well-defined partition function for the torus without this problem. But then it turns out you would run into a different kind of problem later. You would not get a conformal field theory. Uh, so, 
you you take your you take your choice. Um, but uh, but since I like the number twenty four, of course I do want to keep the vacuum energy in there. And so what do we do? What do we do about this irritating problem here in this approach? Um, well, one thing is that the partition function to the twenty fourth power will not change, right? Because this is a twenty fourth root of unity. So what is true is that if we take the left moving wave equation, not with just a single scalar field, but with a 24 component scalar field, in other words, 24 independent scalar fields, uh, its partition function will be well-defined as, uh, as depending on this choice of torus. And believe it or not, that's why in bosonic string theory, people use such a field to describe the motion of the string in space-time. They make there be 24 dimensions transverse to the string world sheet. So the string needs to be moving in 26-dimensional space-time in order to make this calculation uh, work. So also this partition function z to the 24th was also very famous long before string theory. It's reciprocal, which they prefer to work with, is called a modular discriminant and it's called delta. So it's just, here I took the reciprocal of partition function and raised it to the 24th power. This is a function of a type called a modular form. Uh, and it's the simplest modular form that vanishes, uh, it's not zero <laughs> and yet vanishes for tori that become very skinny. Um, there's a, Question from Leon Liu. Can I just ask my question? Yes, please. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So my question would be then can I go to 48 directions? Because it seems like from this argument, you just need a multiple of 24 and it doesn't have to be exactly 24. Right. So from this argument, it just needs to be a, a, a multiple of 24 and if that's the only thing you wanted, <laughs> that, that would be fine. So what we've done here is we've gotten field theories that, that uh, give a well-defined partition, have a well-defined partition function for a Riemannian torus, have a non-trivial vacuum energy, and also, although I have not gotten into this at all, transform well under but not trivially, but well under uh, another way of changing your lattice that gives you the same torus or con the same conformal structure on your torus. Um, for, 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 for bosonic string theory, they have other requirements that, that, that they want, which narrow them down to, to this case. So, so as far as I know, no one has attempted to uh, make a, uh, string theory in 48 dimensions. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, so what we've seen though is something interesting, which is that both super strings and bosonic strings involve some kind of 24 component field on the string world sheet. So for super strings, remember, the 24 components take values in the vector direct sum right-hand spinner direct some left-hand spinner representation. So it's not at all a scalar field, uh, but it's a total of 24 components. And we saw that these are connected in a certain way to the 24 cell because that is showing up in the uh, root lattice for the group spin A. For bosonic strings, we're seeing 24 show up in a apparently different way. We're getting a 24 component scalar field and we're saying that we like that because this modular discriminant has very nice properties, uh, which has this 24th power coming in it. So there's a natural question to ask, which is, are these connected at all? For example, could this uh, modular discriminant function be connected to the 24 cell? And yes, it is connected to the 24 cell. So there is some deeper connection going on here. Let me just conclude by saying what that connection is. Uh, John, do you mind if I yep. also ask? Uh, I, I actually should ask much earlier, but let me just make sure. I think earlier sure. you mentioned this uh, Kelly integral octonium first, and the, yep. there's a construction out of this to default lattice. 
which is um, the, right. Yeah, no, the, the, the Cayley integral octonians for when you expand okay. them by square two, yeah, that the forms way. the E8. Yeah, 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 sorry, I was uh, I said the other way wrong. Sorry, I was typing wrong. So it's a, uh, yeah, the the hero weights integral quaternion is the default. D4 ladders, yeah. Kelly integral octonion is the E8. Yeah, that's right. Uh, There's something very beautiful about all of that because the the D4 lattice gives you these three representations of spin eight, which give you the octonions. <laughs> and then the octonions have this lattice in them, which is the E8 lattice. Uh-huh. And in the case of EA latest, there's a, a meaning for the dense sphere packing in a dimension. So I wonder, are there some meaning for this default lattice as well? That's one question. And Sorry, in the question, D four lattice. The D four lattice. Is there something? It's, yeah. So it's believed that the D four lattice gives you the densest packing of spheres in in four dimensions, which is, with each believed. sphere touching twenty four spheres. Uh, at, in this pattern here. Um, and that hasn't been proved yet, though. Okay. Um, it's probably true, <laughs> but uh, these things are amazingly hard to prove, yeah. And there's also the, I type in the chat, and there's also the leech lattice in 24 dimension. So is there right. a similar construction out of something like generalizing quaternion or integral octonion to some higher dimensional structure, give the leech lattice analogy? Um, I was, I was trying to understand that stuff. Um, there's a nice construction of the leech lattice. I mean, a fairly nice construction of the le leech lattice from three copies of the E8 lattice. Um, it, it's not just the direct sum of three copies of the E8 lattice. That would not give you anything really <laughs> new. Um, but starting from the direct sum of three copies of the E8 lattice, you can build the the, the leech lattice in a fairly simple way. I wouldn't say it's so simple because I <laughs> that I could actually instantly remember it. So, but what that means is that you can think of the leech lattice as sitting inside O plus O plus O in a, in a fairly nice way. Um, so, so Greg Egan and I did some, I mean, other people have thought about this, but Greg Egan and I did some calculations about this. And, uh, and so, one thing you can try to do is like understand algebraic structures on O plus O plus O that make the leech lattice sort of play a special role in there, just like these integral uh, quaternions and integral octonians did. And it doesn't seem to work out quite as, as nicely, um, but there's something called the exceptional Jordan algebra, which is 27 dimensional. <laughs> and and it consists of three by three matrices of octonians. The diagonal entries are real, and the off-diagonal entries being self-adjoint uh, give you three octonians. And so you can think of the leech lattice as sitting inside that exceptional Jordan algebra in the off-diagonal part. And there's something nice about it, but it's it's not quite as nice as as the other uh, <laughs> as the other things. So I've definitely been trying to come up with something like what you're saying. And that's basically where, where I am right now. Okay, thank you. I'll follow up a question afterward, but thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so I have some I have some blog articles called Integral Octonians, and, and it leads up to that type of thing. Um, so right now, the direction I wanna go is to talk about how this um, function here, the modular discriminant is connected to this, uh, 24 vertex uh, shape. Remember, this is also called the binary tetrahedral group. It's a 24 element group sitting inside the quaternions. We, we're gonna need to remember that stuff. Um, okay, so here's a very sketchy tour of some stuff about modular forms and elliptic curves. So we've seen that each point in the complex upper half plane gives a parallelogram, which you can curl up to get a flat Riemannian torus. But it turns out that many different choices of T give conformally equivalent tori. We've already seen that if you add two pi to T, you get the exact same torus, but there are other things you can do to T that give tori that are larger or smaller, but are conformally equivalent. And if you only care about the conformal structure on a torus, then you call it an elliptic curve. So that's what an elliptic curve really basically amounts to. 
Oh, I apologize to experts on elliptic curves. <laughs> uh, and, and so you can study the space of all possible elliptic curves up to isomorphism. That's called the moduli space of elliptic curves. And that will be a quotient of the upper half plane because you know, different points in the upper half plane give you the same elliptic curve up to conformal equivalence. And in fact, the group SL2Z of two by two integer matrices with determinant one, it acts on the upper half plane by fractional linear transformations. In fact, the famous formula. Uh, and, and that quotient of the upper half plane by that group is the moduli space of elliptic curves. But the interesting thing is that SL2C doesn't act in a free way on H. That is some non-trivial elements of SL2Z could act trivially on certain points in the upper half plane. And the reason why ultimately is that there are certain elliptic curves that have more symmetries than the average elliptic curve. So they are fixed by more group elements. And these elliptic curves with extra symmetries are the ones coming from the square lattice, which has more symmetry than a typical lattice, and also the hexagonal lattice. Notice this has a fourfold symmetry and this other one here has a six-fold symmetry. And believe it or not, the four times six equals 24 is connected to what's going on here, but in a rather subtle way. So, so it it's, turns out to be rather irritating and certain important, but irritating to think about this quotient here because, uh, because some points in H have more symmetries than others. Um, the quotient is what they call a stack rather than an actual space. Uh, and so one way to work your way up to dealing with it is to look at a subgroup of SL2Z that does act freely on the upper half plane. And this subgroup goes by the jargony name of gamma three, and it consists of integer matrices with determinant one that are equal to the identity matrix mod three. So each of their entries is equal to the corresponding entry of the identity matrix mod three. So this is a smaller group and this uh, group does act freely on H. So the quotient of the upper half plane mod this smaller group, gamma three, is, is nice and smooth. It doesn't have these singularities showing up from the points of greater symmetry. If, if you mod out by a group action that's not free, you get a space with some singular points. That's the problem. Um, so you can sneak up on what you're really interested in by looking at H mod this smaller group, gamma three. Now you're not done. You, have, you want to get the actual uh, moduli space of elliptic curves. So to study that, what you do is you look at SL2Z modulo the subgroup gamma three, which is a normal subgroup. Uh, and that turns out to be just SL2 with coefficient, with entries in Z mod three, Z mod three. So, so in other words, this is the group of two by two matrices with entries in Z mod three with determinant one. And it turns out by some group theory nonsense that this quotient group acts on the quotient space H mod gamma three. That's just a general thing about how groups work. Uh, and so also another general thing about how groups work is that then if you want to get the actual moduli space of elliptic curves uh, starting from H mod gamma three, you just need to mod out by the further action, by, by the action of this remaining group, SL2, Z mod three. So we're doing the modding out in two steps basically. First modding out by gamma three, then modding out by SL2 Z, Z mod three. But this group gamma three, it's not a stranger to us. This group, sorry, this group SL2 Z mod three, it's not a stranger to us. It has 24 elements. So if you're bored, you can work out how many two by two matrices with entries in Z mod three there are that have determinant one. And you'll see there are 24 of them. And this group is in fact isomorphic to our friend, the binary tetrahedral group. So, so the binary tetrahedral group shows up naturally in the study of, of elliptic curves. And from one point of view, that is a kind of explanation of why the number 24 plays this important role in the study of elliptic curves. And that in turn is a shows up in why the number 24 shows up uh, in a study of conformal field theories, which should be giving, uh, which should have partition functions that depend on elliptic curves. So I've definitely not gotten to the bottom of this stuff. I mean, there's, I hope that you see that this stuff is very mysterious, that 
all sorts of coincidences are happening that make things seem to fit into a big picture, but we haven't really gotten to the full extent of the picture. I mean, people know many more facts than I have told you here. So one way to get more of the sense of the big picture is just to go through and learn more facts about mysterious relations between the numbers eight and 24 and modular forms and the body tetrahedral group, et cetera, et cetera. But I think also it could be possible to really get to the bottom of things in some way and like get a more unified picture of what's going on. Uh, and well, I haven't done it yet by any means. So I just hope that this gets you interested in, in trying to try that for yourself. So thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you Thanks. for the stone bites. Very interesting lecture. Any questions, comments from the audience? Can you go back to your first slide quickly? You had some okay. slick definition of the Clifford algebra. Okay, yeah. Oh, no. Yeah, there. Okay, thanks. That's all I wanted to see. Okay, yeah. Yeah, this thing should remind you of things like, well, like canonical commutation relations and also even more so-called canonical anti-commutation relations where you have like uh, creation and annihilation operators and they, and they obey relations like this. Uh, sometimes people would write a plus one here instead of a minus two or, or maybe a minus one. There are different choices of this, but the Clifford algebra shows up when you're studying uh, creation and annihilation of fermions uh, and the and you're studying the rules that the creation and annihilation operators obey. So that's one of the many places where the Clifford algebra shows up. But then miraculously or not, it, it shows up in the study of the double cover of the rotation group as well. It's not a miracle actually, that, that actually does make sense, but it is interesting for sure. Wait, and if I try to do this for n equals two, I should get the quaternions, right? Yeah, you should get the quaternions. So you get two anti-commuting square roots of negative one, which you could call like i and j, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, but then their product of them, i times j, will give you a third square root of negative one, and we'll call that k. And then what you have to do if you want to understand this stuff, is you have to check that that k is also a square root of negative one and that it also anti, it's forced to anti-commute with the first two square roots of negative one you came up with. Yeah, so it, it, it may seem rather mysterious at first that when you stick in two square roots of negative one, you get the quaternions because they're famous for having these three square roots of one, negative one. But the point is that you get the third one as the product of the first two. Okay, thanks. Yep. Um, maybe you had a question, Juven, yourself. I don't know if you, you, you yes. did. You said, uh -huh. yeah, my question is probably if follow up, maybe it will just be similar to what I asked. I think in your talk, you kind of uh, mentioned A and 24 out of the, the very specific example of this. Uh, the Hilbert's integral quaternion and also the corresponding four dimensional default lattice, if I understand correctly. Uh huh. Right. And, yes. But, and and uh, I think the other question I was commenting is that there is another A and 24 very uh, unique is the EA lattice in A dimension and lattice in 24 dimensions. So if we do the similar exercise, like what you do for the Hilbert's integral quaternion for that, for the analogous probably construction in for the EA lattice and leech lattice, are there some something you will also see uh, out of the similar discussion? Because I when see. I was about A and 24, I'm thinking more along the line of EA and leech lattice, but it seems like you are doing uh, even the minimum example smaller than EA and leech lattice, just a default lattice. You, you are able to already see a lot of A and 24. The, yeah. So there, yeah, each of these cases has its own different peculiarities. Um, so it's, it'd be great if there's like a completely systematic story for all these cases. Um, for the, for E8, 
So the E8 has um, 240 uh, shortest vectors, which you could call root vectors uh, in, in the Lie algebra game. And it turns out though that you, they don't give you a 240 dimensional representation of, of E8. It turns out that you also have to include the dot, the origin, the dot right at the middle uh, to get a representation. And you have to include it eight times essentially. Uh, so you get a 248 dimensional representation from these, from these vertices. But the uh, dimension of the Lie group E8 is 248. Um, and so the representation that you're getting of E8 from that procedure is in fact just the representation of E8 on its own Lie algebra, which is 248 dimensional. So you're not getting, so you're not in the situation where you're getting um, a number of smaller representations, like three smaller representations in this case. You're just getting one big fat uh, 248 dimensional representation. Um, in the case of the Leach lattice, the Leach lattice is not a root lattice. There's not a Lie algebra that has this Leach lattice as its corresponding lattice. So that you can't even really play the game at all, um, at least not in that way. The, there, there are other things you can do with lattices besides uh, build Lie algebras and their representations. Um, one kind of thing you can do is you can build a conformal field theories sometimes. And one thing you can do with the Leach lattice is build a conformal field theory, which actually is very beautiful because it has the monster group as its group of symmetries. A monster group is the largest sporadic finite simple group. It has about 10 to the 54th elements. I'm probably a bit off there, but it's enormous. And the most conceptual way of getting all your hands on that group is, is by building a conformal field theory. This is what Richard Borchardt's did and looking at the symmetries of that field theory. Um, but as, as you can see, each of these cases has its own peculiarities and, and they all seem a little bit crazy. <laughs> uh, so it isn't, it isn't something that anybody knows how to organize into some really simple, or, or even a really uh, coherent story. So we definitely have more to understand, I'd say. Mm -hmm. No problem. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, there are two more questions, I think. Uh, Toya? Uh, yeah, I think you mentioned something about there being like two division algebras over, or Clifford algebras over the complex numbers. Is this related to like, the two periodicity of unitary, the periodicity there of unitary groups? Yes, yes exactly. So so um, this whole bot periodicity story uh, has a version for real for complex Clifford algebras. So if I had just said algebra over C instead of algebra over R, we'd be getting uh, complex Clifford algebras. And they go, the first one is C, and then if you throw in another square root of throw in a square root of negative one to that, you get c direct sum c. And then if you go to the next one, you get two by two matrices in c. So it repeats with period two, where each where the n plus second complex Clifford algebra is two by two complex matrices in the previous, sorry, two by two matrices with entries in the previous one. And as you said quite rightly, you get a pattern like this but with U infinity, the unitary group replacing O infinity and with N plus two replacing N plus eight. So yeah, the, there's a whole parallel story there. And the two stories fit together actually uh, because these eight kinds of matter are really eight out of 10 kinds of matter. And there, there, are, the, there are two more which are connected to the complex uh, bot periodicity. So on YouTube, I have, uh, on my YouTube channel, I have two talks about what's called the tenfold way, which is the study of, of that pattern unifying the real and the complex Clifford algebras. And there's more, more to it than, than, than I've said so far. Uh, so it's, it's pretty interesting. So I was trying to give the number eight 
it's time in the sun in this talk, so I was not wanting to bring in the the uh, the complex stuff, but it, it's definitely part of the story. Okay, uh, Andreas. Hi, um, thank you for this great talk. Uh, Buckminster Fuller um, contrasted the cube and the tetrahedron. He had intuition about that. And I'm curious what your intuition uh, that you could share about the cube and the tetrahedron, because the three-dimensional versions come up here and the four-dimensional versions uh, come up here. So I'm curious what insights you might have in general. Sure, yeah, that's... So the... Um, well, I, unfortunately, I don't have all the pictures right at my fingertips, but there's some very nice pictures. So um, the platonic solids are related to each other in interesting ways. Um, and one way is that if you take a cube, which has eight vertices, and you take every other vertex of the cube, so no two neighboring vertices, uh, you get a tetrahedron. And you, can get, and you can actually get two different tetrahedra in the cube, uh, one of which as well, I can't draw it in with my fingers, but I can imagine it. So, so, so you can partition the eight vertices of the cube into two uh, tetrahedra. Now, one thing that means is that there's a relationship between the symmetry group of the cube and the symmetry group of the tetrahedron. In this talk, what I did is I took the symmetry group of the, I didn't really do it, but I mentioned it. You, you can take the symmetry group of the tetrahedron, take its double cover, and you get these 24, you get this 24 element group consisting of all these points here. You could do the same thing with the symmetry group of the cube, uh, but the cube has uh, a 24 element symmetry group. So its double cover gets to have a 48 gets to have 48 uh, points in it. So there's another subgroup of the quaternions of the unit sphere, which has 48 points. And that's called the binary octahedral group. Maybe you could call it the binary cube group, but people call it the binary octahedral group. But the binary octahedral group contains the binary tetrahedral group, just because you can stick the tetrahedron into the cube. Um, and so there's more to this story when you bring in the cube, but I do not, <laughs> I do not know what all that story is. Uh, so, so like one aspect of the story is that here I took the binary tetrahedral group and I, or the 24 cell if you prefer, and I showed that you could chop it up into eight, sorry, into three hyper octahedra. Mm -hmm. But if you do the same thing for the binary octahedral group, that 48 element thing, you can partition it up into the vertices of six hyper octahedra um, because it's made up of two copies of, of this thing, stuck sort of interwoven in a certain way. So there's a, the, that's really neat. And I have no idea like what you can do with it. <laughs> and for this, I know what you can, one thing you can do with it is that you can get all this interesting math about uh, spinners and octonians, but I don't know what happens if... So, so these three hyperoctahedra, can two of the hyperoctahedra form a hypercube? Yeah, any two of the hyperoctahedra... It could be like hyper, one hypercube plus one hyperoctahedra. Is that a way to think about it? Yeah, that's actually how I started out describing it. I said, you got a okay. hyperoctahedron and a hypercube, and if you overlay them on each other, you get 24 points. But then I said, but the but the vertices of the hypercube can actually be broken down into the vertices of two hyperoctahedra. So so the, so really this 24 really breaks into three hyperoctahedra. And it's a very symmetrical pattern, which is sort of indicated here. If you if you can it's very hard to stare at these things, but, but if you've got good eyes, if you just like look at the red and blue vertices, mm -hmm. here I'm, I'm tracing out a cube that has corners being red and blue vertices. And if you notice carefully, you see that the blue vertices are never next to each other. They're, 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 the red vertices are not next to each other mm -hmm. either. Um, so so that's, that's what's going on. And then the same thing is going on up here. You have another cube with red and blue vertices. So you're getting a hypercube with alternating red and blue 
vertices if you just look at the red and blue stuff. It would be much easier if I could just like instantly cross out all the extra unnecessary stuff. Uh, and so that's a cube being broken. Uh, that's a cube being broken down into two uh, hyperoctahedra, the red vertices and the blue vertices. Yeah, and, it's a very and, beautiful pattern. I'm, I'm in Math for Wisdom and our participant uh, Kirby Erner is really into quadrays. So that's like a coordinate system for tetrahedra. And what this seems to be, it says that it's very natural, like you flatten it out and you get this diagram. So I guess that'd be very encouraging for him. Um, so thank you for this. It's, uh -huh, it was sure. great. Great, sure. Thank you. Any other question, comments? Or we last call? I guess not. Uh, yeah, so mm -hmm. I think we have a 30 minutes seminar. We'll be done. Well done. Thank you. Thank you, Professor John Bites. We appreciate the time. Great. Thanks very much. That was a lot of fun for me, at least. <laughs> I'll follow up. Okay. With, no, thank you again. <laughs>